I'm Todd Harris, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Tending Bar. I want to thank you for joining us today. We have a really um, great story to tell today, which is a little bit different than some of our earlier episodes. As you know, Tending Bar was started as a project to uh, encourage and inspire my law students at Georgetown to think about uh, careers that have a bigger purpose and a positive impact on the communities where we work and live. And uh, that's certainly important. One of the things that we want to explore as we reflect on the legal profession, or a lot of the things we want to explore, are the values that motivate the laws that we are signed up to serve as lawyers. What are, what are those things that we are trying to protect or empower or enable? And how is it helping real people? But a mature look on that or a mature reflection on the law always reveals to us that the law alone is not enough to accomplish all of those objectives. I, for one, became a lawyer because I was really interested uh, in civil rights issues, having grown up in the South. And I'm well aware that though the law is a necessary component of our measures to you know, serve civil rights, it's not enough to make people care about each other or to uh, eliminate discrimination altogether. That's why we have the laws, but it's not enough. Well, sometimes there are other interests out there where we, you know, we also make that realization. Um, part, part, of, uh, part of the outcome of knowing that the law is necessary, but not everything, is realizing that we have to work together in a network with the community of aligned persons who share those underlying values in order to bring about better community. Part of that equation is in, in the United States is our military, which obviously serves a purpose in protecting our safety and protecting our national interests. But you know, we have not always done a great job in, in this country of protecting and, and serving our military personnel. We have a history that's full of shortcomings in that regard. So we all have an interest in taking care of, of that large community of our neighbors. Uh, and the law is not capable of doing all of that. Again, a necessary component of the equation, but not everything. And for that reason, we're going to have a conversation today with our guests, Chris and Betsy Mercado. Uh, you'll hear their story, but importantly, you'll hear about their project to address a very serious situation. We have an epidemic in this, in this country of military and veteran suicides. And they've come up with a very creative way of addressing that. And so I want to introduce you to Chris and Betsy, who are joining us today from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Chris, Betsy, welcome to Tending Bar. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. That's great. So, um, so uh, how, how are things in Fort Leavenworth during the COVID-19 Pandemic? Are, are you uh, fairly fairly normal lives these days, or is uh, is it really shut down? Tell, tell us how you're doing. Um, so things at Fort Leavenworth are, are quiet, but uh, still progressing. So um, you know we've been very fortunate to have not been severely or significantly impacted by the coronavirus, um, but um, you know we are of course complying uh, and and affected as the whole nation is. Um, you know, by COVID nineteen, we can see from the uh, from the flags behind you that you are a military family, and for that we are all grateful and want to say a word of thank you to that. Um, so, Chris, you're the you're the person uh, in in uniform. Can you tell us a bit about what your job is in the military? Absolutely. So, I'm currently the executive officer in the Combined Armed Center for Training. Uh, I work for uh, one of the post deputy commanding generals, um, and you, you could say that uh, I'm kind of the lead of his front office, making sure that you know the clocks are all running on time and you know everything is getting done uh, right and to standard. Well, that's great. So, I, if I understand correctly, you also have a connection to Georgetown, which of course was part of the inspiration for tending bar. What's what's that connection? I do. So in 2014, I was selected by the Army, uh, the Army's Combating Terrorism Center at West Point for the Downing Scholarship. And so from 2014 through 2016, I attended Georgetown in the School of Foreign Services Security Studies Program, where I obtained my Master of Arts. Oh, fantastic. Well, uh, go Bulldogs. Go Hoyas. Hoyas. Uh, that's, that's terrific. 
Well, um, we're here today to talk about uh, this project that you started. It's called Objective Zero. And while we're talking, uh, we'll roll a few images from uh, the Objective Zero website. But uh, I wonder if, uh, Betsy, why don't you tell us just a little bit about Objective Zero? Absolutely. So actually, the, the idea was uh, formed while Chris was attending Georgetown. Uh, several of his classmates are, and are some of our co-founders also attended Georgetown. But um, in the fall of 2014, uh, Chris had recognized over social media that one of his uh, buddies that he served in combat with, Justin Miller, was struggling. Um, the two of them were able to connect over the phone and spoke on the phone for over six hours. And it sparked that idea that the simple act of listening can save lives, that you don't need to be a mental health professional in order to be there, to listen, and to get someone connected to those resources that they may need. Um, you know, Chris nor I are, are mental health professionals. Um, we wanted to do something more than what was, you know, currently available. And so we created the Objective Zero app. We're connecting service members, veterans, their families, and caregivers to a nationwide network of peer support through voice, video, and text message. Uh, we're upstream from traditional crisis lines and text lines, uh, being able to connect someone to a peer that can really relate to what they he or she may be going through. So how do you, how do, you do that? How have you built your network, and, and what's that network look like now? So uh, definitely a grassroots effort. Um, you know. There's so many people that want to help, they may not know how to do it. And so we provided a platform um, that allows service members and veterans, uh, we've got family members and caregivers, uh, clergy, mental health professionals, and also concerned citizens um, that are, are willing to kind of stand by and, and be there and take those phone calls and video chats and texts whenever you know, someone reaches out. Well, so tell us how it's, how it's gone so far. How has it been adopted? How is it being used? So to date, uh, we have over 8,000 users. We have over 1,700 trained suicide prevention ambassadors that are on our platform. Uh, they're in all 50 states wow. and in 26 countries across the United States or across the world. Basically, wherever there is a service member or a veteran um, across the world is, is where we're where we're seeing both users and volunteers. So how are you getting the word out about, about Objective Zero? How are um, persons who, who need the network uh, finding the app and, and uh, how's that happening? So predominantly it's been over social media and word of mouth. Uh, we have our volunteer network themselves are going out into their local communities uh, to vet centers, to VAs, they're attending events, that uh, service members and their families and veterans and their families are attending. Um, and so just spreading it that way, it's been very successful for us thus far. Um, we've also had some um, national media coverage. Uh, Chris and our co-founder, Justin, were on the Today Show on Veterans Day. Um, we've been in the Military Times. And so um, that exposure has really helped as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, so I wonder if you have a sense of uh, the effectiveness of, of the project. How is it, how is it working? Do you have some uh, stories you can share with us? I, you know, I know the app is uh, anonymous for users if they, if they wish it to be, but um, you know, what can you tell us about how it's working? Well, I, I can definitely share at least one story. Um, so we, um, we, we have folks that we call super ambassadors or, you know, peer support ambassadors who receive a large number of texts uh, or calls and I happen to get a lot of them. So uh, in one particular case, we had a, um, a veteran uh, who was struggling with his transition out of the military, had been out for some years, uh, was unemployed, was addicted to uh, alcohol, uh, and was having severe relationship distress. Uh, and, you know, all of these issues, you know, were kind of related to one another, right? Uh, and they were kind of feeding on, on one another. And this, this veteran reached out to me through the app. Uh, and we connected and we stayed connected for almost six months as I helped him work through some of those particular issues. You know, I helped him get connected to an alcohol treatment program. Upon completion of that program, I helped connect him to employment. Uh, and, you know, gradually over time, you know, we were able to work together to, you know, ameliorate some of those stressors in his life. And we've stayed in contact since then. Wow. Well, uh, good for you. Well, that's great service. And, you know, for, for viewers and listeners who aren't familiar with uh, the issue generally, can you just 
talk to us a little bit about how widespread you know, the issue of military suicide is and uh, you know, help us understand the phenomenon. Absolutely. So right now, every day, on average, about 20 veterans and one active duty service member are dying by suicide. This is at a rate that is more than double that of the civilian population. And, you know, for some segments of the military and veteran community, it's even as high as two and a half times as likely. So female veterans are especially at risk of self-harm. Uh, you know, female veterans are dying at a rate that's two and a half times greater than that of their civilian counterparts. Uh, you know, we see this as a public health crisis. Uh, we also know that we are just one part of a broader network of support that, uh, you know, the, the technology and the tool that we've created is, is not going to solve the problem by itself. And that, you know, we rely upon that network of partners in this community to, you know, to help address that problem. So uh, is the issue, uh, obviously, we understand the, the stresses and pressures or, or some of them. Um, that are on active duty military and on on uh, veterans and uh, you know and their families and communities, um, but are they are they um, going undiagnosed or are they are they having difficulty obtaining access in the traditional VA system? Um, you know what what is the issue there that's preventing us from getting them faster or better help? That that's a, actually a fantastic question. Um, not all veterans that leave the service leave on, on honorable notes. And so many veterans were, you know, kicked out of the military for whatever reason, and they don't have access to VA healthcare. Um, they may live in rural areas where there are no VA um, access points. Um, that stigma that seeking help is, you know, a bad thing is very pr predominant even now. Things, the tide is changing with that. Military leaders are really encouraging their troops to seek help when they need it, but not everyone's doing that. And so, um, you know, there are a number of factors, but it's access. Um, there's a lot of choices when it comes to getting that help. And so, it, you know, it's hard to like figure out what to do, where to go. So we're able to help kind of streamline that system and, you know, talking to a peer and kind of help navigating that system or, or talking with someone that's gone through what has been really helpful for many of our volunteer for our users. Oh, that, that's great and interesting. I, I imagine it, it's, it's probable, it seems, that some of those who are discharged, um, not, not with honorable discharges, may be because of underlying mental health issues. Is that, is that possibly the case? And then they may not have access uh, to services from the VA. Do I, do I understand correctly Absolutely. that that um, your services are available to then anyone regardless of their discharge status, any veterans? That's correct. It's a, our app is free to download, free to use for anyone that has been in the military or, or still in the military, regardless of that discharge status. That's fantastic. Um, well, um, so I, I, you know, I'd like to ask you sort of the the. The connection, uh, the question that got us started is really about what are the underlying um, sort of motivators? You know, uh, you talked about, you know, Chris, you had a conversation with someone that was in need and that led to some, uh, a light bulb uh, going on. But, um, you know, what are the interests that we're serving uh, with, with Objective Zero? Right. So, you know, the Objective Zero name really was, you know, kind of born of the belief that we're trying to achieve a, uh, uh, a state called functional zero, right? The point at which military service is no longer a distinguishing characteristic in suicide. Um, but the, the factors and the underlying conditions that, that lead someone through that downward spiral of the suicide are, are oftentimes very unique. I think, I, I do think that if we could put our finger on, you know, kind of the one factor, um, you know, we would probably be more successful as a society for addressing this. Um, but, you know, these can include everything from, you know, combat trauma to financial stressors, relationship stressors. We find oftentimes that transition points um, are significant catalysts to, to that downward spiral into depression and suicide. So transition points when someone maybe joins the military, um, so when someone transitions out of the military, uh, those are oftentimes very stressful periods. Um, certainly the current situation, you know, under, you know, COVID-19 restrictions is increasing stress 
uh, uncertainty on families. You know, obviously our economy is significantly impacted. Many people are unemployed. Yeah, tell tell uh, us about so, that. You know, have, you, these, have you seen a, a significant uptick in usage or a difference in the usage pattern since the pandemic has hit? We have. So we've actually, in, in March of this year, had one of the highest amounts of users um, and, and text messages. That's um, currently the, the most popular is text messaging through the platform. Um, but people are re- reaching out for a variety of reasons. We have medical professionals that were were in the military or currently in the military that have been, you know, reaching out for extra support. They get off a long shift and you know, kind of at their wits end. They're seeing terrible things. They're, you know, those stresses are just amplified. And so, um, you know, we're really glad that we have a platform that is readily available to meet the needs of you know, many of our users. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, um, tell me, you know, what are the things that these interests need? So you're one component, as you described it, uh, of addressing the problem. Um, what are the other things that we need to do? What does the community and the society need to be doing to address the situation? What's your prescription? So that's a great question. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, we need to um, broadly connect people socially, right? So social connectedness is an important component of this, uh, particularly during, you know, COVID-19. Physical distancing is absolutely appropriate, but we, we need to remain socially connected. We also need to make sure that we're connecting people to the right resources. There, there's a lot of resources out there. Objective Zero is but one of many. Um, but when, when people are either overwhelmed by the resources or they're unaware of the resources, we find that you know, in, in either of those two situations, you know, they're not being connected to the appropriate resource when they need it most. And so there's this idea of, you know, conserving resources and, and, and providing those resources when they're needed. Um, and then, you know, providing purpose, um, you know, meaningful purpose uh, in people's lives and meaningful connections. Uh, I find that, you know, the works of Viktor Frankl really do speak to me, right? He, he spoke a lot about, uh, you, know, m- you know, meaning and purpose. Uh, and so restoring that, that meaning of purpose, especially for a veteran or a service member, you know, in the military, you know, we contribute to something that is much greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. We, we live a very, you know, purpose-driven, mission-driven life. Uh, and that transition out of the military can be, you know, a very, you know, punctuated moment of our lives where we're now disconnected from a tribe where we were, you know, very intimately connected, you know, side by side with our brothers and sisters in arms, contributing to something much greater than ourselves. And suddenly we find ourselves disconnected from that. So I think the prescription you know, is, is largely about reconnecting. And if I may add, um, you know, there's a huge disconnect that we're seeing between the military and civilian populations. And people, you know, assume that, you know, they see a veteran, oh, he has PTSD, you know, he's been traumatized by, by war <clears throat> and such. And you know, that isn't always the case. And um, we have many of our volunteers that are civilians that have no connection to the military that have gone through our training. Um, and I think the biggest thing that, you know, civilians, people that may not have a relationship with the military could take away is that, you know, we can all play a part in this. You know, suicide is not just an issue within the military community. It's, it's, a, it's a global epidemic. And, you know, knowing to ask those hard questions, you know, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Do you have a plan? As hard as they may be, we can all do our part to really be aware of, you know, what's going around um, in, in someone else's life, uh, whether they're a veteran, a conservative member, or, you know, or not. Um, but be willing to ask those, those tough questions and really be there for, you know, the people in our lives. Oh, that's great. Well, so that, that um, raises a great question for us. And that is, if people are interested and want to help out, how can they help out? Yeah, so you can go to our website, objectzero.org. There's a link on Become an Ambassador, and you can uh, download the app, uh, take the training. We have the training available through our website um, and a portal called PsychArmor. It's about about 20 different classes on um, how to speak to a veteran, how to help someone in crisis, um, understanding the problem of military and veteran suicide, um, kind of how to be there, how to coach someone into care, um, take that training, download the app. It's free. Um, you may never have to use it. Hope you never have to use it, but you can, you know, have that, that tool in your back pocket for what, you know, when you need it. That's terrific. And Objective Zero is a, is a nonprofit corporation of 501c3. 
Uh, are there ways that um, people are able to help out the, the corporation itself? What are your needs? So we're always looking for talented individuals that can help, uh, you know, with whatever they want, whether it's helping us on the, the, the administration side, um, you know, trying to help us with um, what else? Well, you know, folks can always champion our cause, right? So they, you know, as they encounter veterans or service members in their lives, you know, they can recommend they, that those service members or veterans download the app and that they have it as a resource. Uh, they can help connect us to their networks. They can always volunteer. We're always, as Betsy mentioned, looking for folks, you know, to you know, volunteer their time or their talent. Uh, and then, you know, as a 501c3, we we basically subsist on, you know, the charitable contributions of others. So as people are able and willing to uh, help support our cause, you know, that's what that's what keeps us uh, moving our mission forward. Well, terrific. Well, I hope uh, a lot of people watch this this uh, discussion today on Tending Bar. And so that uh, so many more people can learn about Objective Zero. Well, I, I want to say thank you for, for joining us today. And, um, you know, this, what a great conversation. I, I'm inspired by what you're doing. Uh, for full disclosure, uh, you know, our, our firm's been doing a little work uh, with you guys, try, trying to help out in, in the ways that we can. And uh, we're, we're at the ready to try to help. What you're doing is so valuable. And um, I just, you know, just want to say a word of thanks for you being with us today. Well, so um, I want to thank all of you for watching or listening to us today on Tending Bar. Our conversations are, as a starting point, reflecting on the legal profession and reflecting on the law. But in, importantly, what we're after as our objective is to reflect on the values that are underlying the law and the legal profession. What, are, what, are, what interests are we serving? And as we do that, we've got to remind ourselves constantly that in order to serve those objectives, it requires partnership with an entire community of good people who share those same interests in common with us. Folks like Chris and Betsy Mercado, who are doing such great work there in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And so I hope you'll join us again for the next Tending Bar as we continue these conversations, and we'll see you soon.